We're going to read together 1 Peter 4, 1 to 4. Yes. 1 Peter 4, verses 1 to 4. 1, 2, 3. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So, so as, as to live for, for the rest, rest of the time in the, in the flesh, flesh, no longer for human passions, but, but for the will of God. God. For, for the, the time, time that is past suffices for doing, for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, passions drunkenness, drunkenness, orgies, drinking, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. idolatry. Thank you, God, for your word. We pray the weight and the authority of your word touches us and changes us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, dear. So I, I couldn't stop thinking. I mean, I really appreciated the message last Sunday. And as I told Brian before he gave the message days before, I said to Jennifer, I said, I keep seeing, you know, Jesus praying for me. And I said, did you ever ask Jesus to intercede for you? Like ask him to pray something for you. Because if you look at what Brian explained, Jesus in, in Hebrews 7 says that he's in constant intercession for us. So he's in this priestly duty and he's praying for us. And, um, but I mean, I, I thought, did, you know, normally we just pray to Jesus. And I thought, well, while he's up there, maybe I'll engage that process. And Jesus, how about you pray for me for this thing? Um, anyway, so it's interesting that Brian preached on a similar theme just a few days after that. And then Mal, I think you said that you had a similar desire to ask Jesus to pray for you uh, in some way. Anyway, but I couldn't stop thinking of my message I gave uh, the week before that too. It was uh, with me the whole time. Um, the body and the importance that God places on our bodies. And we, let me remind you what the starting verse was two weeks ago. It was Romans 12, 1. I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. It, it's so profound to me. I know the Holy Spirit's speaking to me, and I hope he's speaking to all of us, that the body is the beginning of spiritual worship. We don't think that way. We think it's the opposite. The body's like holding us back. But what we do with our body how we treat our body, how we treat all bodies, not just our own body, uh, indicates it, it enables us to either worship God spiritually or to move away from him. If we want to be spiritual followers of the Lord, we actually have to make a priority of treating our bodies properly, whether it's a holy use or an unholy use, and whether we see other people that way. We live in a society that does the opposite. Everything we're being taught and shown is a deprecation of the body. It's a debasement of the body. And we know that we, each one of us, is created in the image of God. And Satan's desire is for us to devalue the body, to treat it like trash, to treat each other like whores. I, I don't know what else to say. You know, to make our bodies something that we just use and just treat, you know, whether it's imbibing excessively in alcohol or drugs or sex, or I mentioned how I prayed for girls for deliverance that cut themselves, you know, uh, people want to commit suicide. And pornography is probably the worst thing we've got right now. But songs, like the, the rapper songs, it's all a, talking about women like they're trash, you know? If you listen to the lyrics of most contemporary songs, it's not honoring the body in a godly way. Movies, sexual exploitation of women, children. We've got all kinds of sex trafficking going on all over the place. And it is Satan's goal to make us just, you're just trash. I'll just use the body. And, and that's why people can't come to God in a spiritual, full spiritual way. Because we haven't begun to honor the body like that. Well, the body is our meeting place. It's the way we interact on earth. Our spirit, our soul interacts on earth through the body. And we demonstrate more than just uh, good deeds. We demonstrate our faith in God through the body, how we use it, how we treat one another. And it shows our faith in many ways in how we deal with the body. One, we talked about praying for healing. 
and of course the laying on of hands as the Bible instructs us. And that is an honoring to God and an appreciation for the body to restore it to health, physical health. And it's also a demonstration of our faith that God wants to heal you and that God honors your body. He loves your body. He, he, he values your body and so should we. We want it restored to health. We want it restored to vibrancy. And we don't want to do anything to harm the body. We don't want to bring it down and, and, and cause uh, us to be less than what we should be. The other side of this, the spiritual worship side, includes raising your hands, expressing your love to God, clapping when we hear worship music, praising the Lord, bowing down and worshiping God, and using our tongues. We've said some of these things a couple weeks ago. We use our feet to bring the gospel to people, but we also dance in celebration when we hear and uh, feel the spirit. Your body is a key center point for this. But we have to be self-controlled because our bodies, we have, to, we have to treat it as it's a holy vessel. This is where God resides inside us. His spirit is in every believer. We are called the temple the, the body is the temple of the Lord, of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, we must treat the body. We have a governorship. We have a stewardship over our body that's critical. Nobody's governing your body but you, right? I mean, unless you're violated. Um, but we control our body, self-control. Keeping it holy so that our spiritual worship is vibrant. John 4.24 says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Do you see how these go together? Romans 12, 1 says, uh, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And then 424 says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. I worship God by living a holy and pure life, by honoring the body that God gave me and maybe other people's bodies. So I'm not violating them too, because I'm recognizing them as the image of God. Sexual sin. Paul says, all sins are outside the body except for sexual immorality. I've debased the body. This, this is like the number one thing, guys. You know, and, and, and this is why the devil's propagating homosexuality and divorce and, uh, well, divorce, I'm saying, it, there's other aspects of that. When, you, when a woman is divorced from her, her husband and then she goes out and has sex with a man, the Bible says that the man that divorced the wife caused her to commit adultery, right? Because once God joins us together, we get young people who might want to get married someday. Once God gets together, you are one flesh. That's the way he sees it. Doesn't matter what you do. You, you can go and get divorced, but he says, no. <laughs> you said you committed to one another. You're one flesh. You had sex together. You consummated the marriage. You're one flesh to me. And you can say, well, I don't like that person anymore. I'm going to leave. You can say whatever you want, but spiritually you're going to be damaged because his law says you can't divide that. So think about that before you get married, please. But that's also honoring and worshiping God. And then there's a, there's a mutual submission, physical submission in the bodies of a husband and wife. And God expects you to honor that. And he says anyone who defiles the marriage bed, he will, he will deal with. He will hold accountable. That's a scary thing. But thank God we have his mercy is interwoven in everything. But still, it's a spiritual act of worship. I think this is so amazing. When you, when you start to see it that way, it'll help you in every other way. It'll help you with lust. It'll help you with drugs and alcohol and everything else. And then, you know, especially if you say you're a Christian, you believe in Jesus, you can't get to him spiritually until you begin to see this, that you honor the body, yours and other people's. Um, and in the opening verse that, I, that we read, 1 Peter 4, um, since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. This is all related to sin. 
once we begin honoring the body, we don't want to sin. You don't want to look at pornography. You don't want to drink excessively with alcohol or use drugs. You don't want to commit adultery or fornication, right? So you, you, those things, uh, if we've done them, we have to repent of them or we'll never, we'll always, there's always going to be this like blockage between you and that spiritual peace with God, the love of God, which he will resolve, but it requires repentance. I had an experience one time. I don't know how to explain this, but uh, clearly, I, uh, God, help me explain it. But I knew God was telling me I had to stop something in my life. Something wasn't right. And I wanted to, but I couldn't. And I see this, you know, drug addicts have this problem. and other, There are a lot of issues that can fit under this umbrella. It could be anger. It could be lust. It could be all kinds of things. But um, I remember calling out to God. I said, you know, God, give me a fear of you. G give me a repentance that just terrifies me because I can't create that on my own, right? You know, you can feel the love of God, but so all of a sudden, if you're, if you're blocked by some sin, especially a, a, it could be a sin in the body or anything else, you won't feel the love or the intimacy of God. You know it's there because maybe you had it at one time, but now you're separated from it. You can't get it back no matter what you do. And you don't, you know, so you've got to call out to him to break that barrier down. And it may require you, usually it requires a repentance that is based on a terrifying fear of God. I'm talking about saved people who understand the grace of God. You know whether you're in the grace of God. You can feel it. I believe you can feel it. And you know when you have the peace of God and the love of God in your heart. That's the way you're supposed to be. And when you don't have it that way as a Christian, you know there's this separation. That's what I'm talking about. And then you can't fake it. You can't get that back. And then you, you've got to call out to him, help me, God. Help me to come close to you again. But it won't happen without repentance. It's no way. I heard a story of someone who did something that I know that they regret that involves sexual immorality recently. And I'm thinking, if I were to counsel that person, the only thing I can tell them is, Repent. Seek God. Because I really don't believe you're saved when you go off into deep sin like that. Perpetual sin. It doesn't matter how many Bible studies. It doesn't matter how many things you can spit back about the Bible and, and Jesus. It, you will know. In fact, the Bible says that you'll have a dreaded fear. He said, don't be like those that shrink back, that are going to shrink back in fear when Jesus comes back again. And can you picture yourself? I mean, maybe there's something right now that God's been saying, you, you change this. Are you sure you feel the peace of God? Do you, are you expecting him to come back? He's going to say, come on back, baby. You're wonderful. Or are you starting to feel like, man, I got a problem I got to deal with. I'm not ready to see him. If you've got that, that's the Holy Spirit giving you a serious warning. And don't dismiss it. Well, anyway. My own personal experience, I was kind of going through that, and I said, Lord, please, whatever it takes, you know, just give me this fear. And I can remember one night, I could not sleep. <laughs> and it was just this constant dread and fear all night. So scared, so afraid to meet God. I, you know, I have to tell you this because I, I believe in the grace of God. I believe in the salvation through faith. I mean, that, but I knew he wanted me to change this, and I didn't. It just kind of prolongs it. Like, you take it a little seriously, and then you don't. You take it seriously, you kind of dabble here, dabble there. And he said, no, no, Bill. That's you, no dabbling, no nothing. That's gone. you got to go. And um, I remember waking up in a sweat and all night long just, just kind of just scared, just total scared, fear throughout my, I don't, supernatural scared. <laughs> and then I woke up and then that kind of lingered. It's like it stayed with me, remembering that and just thinking, uh, being grateful. Because after a while, then he lifts that fear off. I mean, it's still this like <laughs> reverential respect, right? But that dread, like, I don't know if I'm saved kind of fear um, is gone. And then you can then fear, you can then feel 
that intimate love in your heart again. You can then feel like, I, I think I'm good right now, you know, and then that thing's gone. But there's always the possibility that you can fall back into that. And you've got to pray for that continual respect of God and fear to keep you out of that. And then when he says no more, when you know he's saying no more, not even a little bit, you better, you got to get to that point because he's not playing. And uh, that is how I kind of see 1 Peter 4. And you got to suffer in the flesh to deny yourself. And you, you have to pull away from whatever it is that is tempting you or causing you to fall into sin. It could be a person. It could be your work. It could be greed. It could, you know, whatever. Music, ungodly music. He says in verse 2, So as to live the, for the rest of the time in the flesh and the body, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. Yeah. For that, the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. Gentiles are non-believers, okay, in this context. Don't believe in Jesus. Living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. But I want to ask you a question. Is anyone surprised at you because you don't participate in the sins of the body? Or are you just kind of going along with them? Hey, he's just like, well, he's all right, he's cool, he's just like us. They would be surprised if you changed, wouldn't they? That you said, I'm not getting drunk with you guys anymore. I'm not having sex with you. I'm not having, you know, I, I, I am not. And then they'd be surprised. Now, where are you? Are you, everything's cool, we're all getting along together? Or are they surprised, whoa, what's wrong with you? That's, that's the test right there. I know it, like in my office, Jennifer had the same experience. It's really cool because people, sometimes they don't even know I'm a Christian or a pastor or whatever, but they sense something. And I've had so many people, I don't hear cursing in my office anymore. Not, not a word. Well, this one guy, he cursed like a, not even a real bad curse word, but like a nominal curse word. And he looks at me, he goes, oh, so I'm sorry. <laughs> Why well, didn't say anything? <laughs> he did it a couple times. He doesn't not not a peep out of him. No, word. and you, you remember we had a, another guy who got saved in my office who used to be with us. He cursed all the time until he got saved, you know. But and he would like say, "Oh, excuse me," you know. And 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 many times I've had this uh, without telling them that I'm a Christian or a pastor. And and Jennifer had the same experience in her office where they, they wouldn't curse around her, but they would curse around each other when she wasn't there. So this is kind of what I'm talking about. There's something because when I got saved, I couldn't, before I got saved, I couldn't stop cursing. <laughs> just no way. It was just natural part of me like breathing. And then when I got saved, it left me just completely and totally. I haven't cursed since. I mean, I might, you know, like I use the word C-R-A-P, but that's not, <laughs> not in the same fashion, you know, okay. I'm talking about junk or something, okay. But none of the bad words. <laughs> um, and uh, I couldn't do that on my own. And it's interesting because that's what God took away from me. I mean, 100%. And then when people are around me, that's the first thing I notice. They don't want to curse around me, even without my not saying. See, this is the kind of thing I think that happens when we begin to purify our bodies and purify ourselves and exercise self-control in parts of our lives. And I think especially those areas that you've been weak in in the past, if it's drunkenness, sex, whatever, lust, greed, anger, uh, the sharp tongue, um, whatever that is, once that's gone, once God's taken it away, either he mercifully does it like he did with me or through repentance, he then takes it away. You know, you say, I'm done with this, God help me. I'm, I'm really terrified to be violating your law. And then that purity will shock people, especially people that knew the way you used to be. But if you keep giving into those things and you're just like them, there's no surprise there.
You're one of us. We're all going to hell together. <laughs> you know? That's it. It's all right. We're going to have a big party there. If that's what you call a party yeah, for eternity. Flames licking at your bottom and worms eating your hide. Um, but they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. And for this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead. That though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. This is why the gospel was preached. Not to go on living like a heathen. <laughs> Not to go on living in sin. And dishonoring the body and dishonoring God. You know, these people, he's saying, your friends who are doing all these things that are not saved, they're going to meet God. And you're going to meet them too. And we're all accountable. We're all accountable for those sins that we do in the body. That's what the Bible says. And that is why the gospel is preached. That's why we're doing this. It isn't to just go to church. It isn't just to feel good. It isn't to play around with your Bible and your stuff, you know. It is to get the hell out of hell. It is to get out of sin. It is to stop sinning. It is to be scared to the point where I don't want to do that anymore. Now, the love of God can draw you out too, but if it doesn't, I preached on this before, if the love of God isn't enough to get you to live a holy life and treat your body with respect, then you better pray to him for the fear. Because the day of judgment will come. You don't want to be the one who's surprised. <laughs> you want to surprise your friends that you're different. And they can mock you, they can drop you, they can do whatever they want with you, but I ain't going there. And then on the day of judgment, you don't want to be the one that said, I thought I was cool with you, God. Be scared if you're not scared. <laughs> That's what I, unless it's gone. If the sin's gone, and the pattern, the habit of sin, now I'm not saying we won't make mistakes, but the habit of sin, if that is not gone, you're the one who needs to be scared. And if you're not scared, you got a problem. You may not have things turn out for you the way it should, or the way you want it to. It will turn out the way it should, but not the way you want it to. And the only way you can know you've gotten there is when you have that peace and reconciliation in your heart, and you know it. You want to keep it. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. You can't pray properly when you're living a hellish life, when you're living a sinful life. There's a block. I couldn't pray before I got saved and, and cleaned out. You know, even when you backslide as a saved person, I, I'm... I'm more concerned about this term backsliding because you're resting on your once commitment to Jesus and his grace, and then you fall into sin and you start falling away from the Lord. I think you've got a problem. I mean, it is a problem, but I think it's bigger than what we realize. I don't think you're just going to walk through judgment day unless you take on that sin that he's telling you and eliminate it. Because you can tell in your heart, this, I'm not right. And you even have a fear. I know it. I know you have a fear that maybe I'm going to hell because I'm doing such, 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 such. That ought to tell you right there. That's the Holy Spirit warning you, trying to save you. Uh, I'd rather have that fear hit me with like a baseball bat and shake that junk out of my life. Above all, now there's a positive side to this once we start getting through there. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. That's the focus. That's where we're going. Now, how do I know I'm saved? I want to I go through. I've got some other stuff here that I really enjoyed going through myself. But, um, you know, Jesus says in John 14, 21, whoever has my commandments keeps them. He it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. If you don't feel the love of God because of sin in your life, that's the problem. Now, the, the James says, because we're looking at salvation, we're looking at faith that I'm going to be saved by, 
right? And how do I demonstrate, how do I know I have faith in Jesus that's going to save me? And I got to ask you that because we have so many examples in the Bible of people that would, they appeared to have faith in Jesus, but they weren't saved. And they, in other words, they had a knowledge that Jesus was the son of God, but they weren't saved. Who were they? James makes it very clear to us. In James 2, 14 and 19, I'm going to shorten it. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? And the answer he gives is no, it can't. You have to have faith that do good deeds. But good deeds will not lead to your salvation. The Pharisees in the Bible did a lot of good deeds, but they were not saved. The Pharisees believed in God. The Pharisees believed in angels. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection of the dead. But they weren't saved because they didn't have the right relationship with Jesus. And in James 2.19 says, you believe that God is one. Do you believe that? I think we all believe that here. You do well. That's a good thing to believe. Even the demons believe in shudder. The demons believed, the demons talked to Jesus. They said, here you go, um, Matthew 8, 28 to 29. And when he came to the other side to the country of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men met him, coming out of the tombs, so fierce that no one could pass that way. And behold, they cried out, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? <laughs> we have family members that don't call him the Son of God. <laughs> they don't call Jesus Son of God, but the demons called him Son of God. Have you come here to torment us before the time? They knew Judgment Day was coming. They knew Jesus is the Son of God. They knew he was the judge, but they weren't saved. So they had, in effect, a form of faith that he was Jesus, that Jesus is the Son of God. We have the sons of Sceva in Acts 19, uh, 13 to 16. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered them, all of them, and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. They used the name of Jesus to do deliverance, but they weren't saved, and the demon knew it and attacked them. You can't just use the name of Jesus. You can't just say he's the Son of God and think you have salvation. The slave girl, we talked about that a couple weeks ago in Acts 16, 16 to 18. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us crying out, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. She was not saved. But she gave the gospel message. What kind of faith do you have? What kind of faith leads to salvation? I got another one here for you. Jesus says in Luke 13, 22 to 28, he went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And he said to them, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence. Isn't that the communion table? Maybe. And you taught in our streets. Isn't that the church too? Aren't we being taught the word of God? Aren't, aren't we all there? But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. Churchgoer hearing the word of God. Churchgoer taking the communion. Churchgoer saying, Jesus, Jesus. And then Jesus says, I don't know who you are. All you workers of evil. 
In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets of the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. What kind of faith will save you? If you are a worker of evil, if God has said repent and you didn't do it. Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Are you doing the will of his Father? It's not the saying, it's the doing. It's the doing in faith. It's the doing with your body. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Man, these guys are prophets. And cast out demons in your name. And do many mighty works in your name. And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Again, it wasn't the religious junk. It wasn't the pastor preaching. It wasn't the casting out of demons. It wasn't the prophesying. It wasn't doing all good deeds. It wasn't enough. They were also workers of evil. And Jesus said, I don't know you. Judas was a bro among the apostles. He would have been number 12. He was casting out demons. He was preaching the gospel. He had a little five-finger discount around the tithing box, and he had a few issues with loyalty, but he was just like Peter and James and Andrew. He was just like them all. He was doing all the same things, just like Pastor Bill doing his stuff, preaching the gospel, Casting out demons. But what happened to Judas? It says in John 17, 12, While I was with them, Jesus said, I kept them in your name. He's talking to the Father, which you have given me. All of them. I kept all of these guys. I have guarded them. And not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Jesus knew. I mean, Judas knew Jesus personally. He knew the gospel. He ministered. But did his faith save him? No. The kind of faith that saves wasn't even in Peter. When Jesus said, who do you say that I am in Matthew 16, 15 to 17? He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. <laughs> Sounds good. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. Praise the Lord. But what happened? Matthew 26, 31 to 35. Then Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered him, Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, Truly, I tell you, this very night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. What happened? He denied him. Dined him out. <laughs> Just, was he saved? Well, you can't be saved unless you have faith in Jesus. So now where is Peter at this moment? In a state of confusion, I'd say the least. He might even be on the verge of not being saved. Later on, after Peter confesses and repents and Jesus draws him back, we have another episode in Galatians 2, 11 to 12. But when Cephas, that's Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, Paul said, because he stood condemned. The head of the church stood condemned. Mercy! <laughs> the head of the church. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles, but when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. Peter may not have been saved at this point. Don't count on men. <laughs> Don't count on men. What was he doing? Religious practices. 
He doesn't want to eat with the Gentiles. He wants to do what the Jews are doing. And all of that was supposed to be gone under the new covenant because we're saved by what? Grace through faith, not by works, not by religious law keeping. So we have examples here of people that appear to be religious who are saying Jesus, Jesus, who are doing ministry or doing miracles, and they are not saved. Wow. That's why I thank God that that night I went to bed in total and utter fear of my life. And I woke up and I still have an Thank God I still have an element of that still left in me. And I just pray that I never lose that. But what happens? So now what kind of faith saves you? That's the kind of faith that won't save you. Tell me, Pastor Bill. I want to know because I don't want to go to hell. Well, one, you don't want to be a worker of lawlessness. We can kind of see that there. You know, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, but I discipline my body, keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. This scares the heck out of me. I don't either. I don't want to tell you. In fact, I hate giving these messages. Do you know why? Because I'm accountable when I tell them to you. And I also know my weakness in the flesh and my past. And I think if I tell them this, and the Bible says in James that don't all of you rush in to want to be teachers of the law because you're going to be held at a higher standard. So this scares me. But I'm thinking, well, if I don't tell them, I'm also accountable. <laughs> so God, help me to do this. And I want to be like Paul, who is the author, who teaches us all about grace. But he says, I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching others, I myself shall be, should be disqualified. Oh. So now, that fear of God, which I pray he grants all of us, is real and lasting so that I do take this seriously. And I don't just want to be a preacher. I don't just want to tell you about Jesus and talk about my Christianity. But I want that fear of God to change me permanently. And whatever I'm doing with this, I'm doing it for the glory of God, not for my own pleasure, my own self-seeking. So that, on the day of judgment, I hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Not you play a, <laughs> you know, you're just making it look good. I know all about you. Okay, I don't want that. John 21, 17. Here's the good part. John 21, 17. This is where Jesus had been resurrected and Peter had been a failure after denying Jesus. And he's fishing and he sees on the bank the Savior making breakfast for him. And then they're sitting together. And Jesus says to him three times, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. That's repentance. Not just saying religious stuff. Not saying, I wish I didn't do that. I, I, I got to stop doing that. This was a deep fear that Peter had, I'm sure. We know that. He was grieved. He didn't even want to minister anymore. He's just, I'm going to go back fishing. Wow, how many times have I done that? I don't like fishing, but I, <laughs> how many times do I just want to go to work and make money and not do ministry anymore? Yeah, how much, you know, many times it's just because I don't feel good about my walk with the Lord, right? So you say, Jesus, I want to have this relationship with you. And Jesus wants to know, do you love me? Do you love him? And when you get to the point where you can really say you love him because you've repented and all this junk is gone and you're serious about it and you've been broken down, and you recognize that you need him, not religion, not a church. Not, I mean, we, <laughs> you need each other to come together. But what I'm talking about is your salvation is with him. 
Your family is here. Your growth and your maturing in Christ is here. But we don't save you. The church doesn't save you. Your good deeds don't save you. This saves you. So he had previously identified Jesus in Matthew 16, 15, 15 to 16. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. But that didn't save him. He was blessed to know it and to repeat it. But what saved him was when he could say, I love you, Jesus. And how do we love him? By knowing that he loves us. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. No church dogma. <laughs> no priest bill throwing water over you. This is something else. He loves you. He loves you and you get that. And because you admit you're a sinner and you're a broken person and you confess your sins and now you repent, you're turning away, now there's a room in your heart to really receive the love and feel the love. That's the value of the fear of God. It allows the love to prosper and grow inside you and it's a real love because now you remove the junk and that veil, that barrier is lifted off. So repentance makes way for the flow of God's love, which then you feel and you reciprocate. And you say, wow, he loves me so much. He forgave me of all this junk, all the sins I did in my body. And I can feel it. And I want to tell the Lord I love him. And not just tell him. I want to live in my body as a result of knowing he loves me. And I want to love him. I want to express the love. And the love is expressed as we started off Back in 1 Peter 4, going down to verse 7, I said, uh, verse 8, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. You love me, man? Your sins. Don't worry about them, baby. You know, the past sins. Because you're living in love. You're loving me. You're lo I want you to love me. Do you hear me? Not just me. I'm just here. Okay. And then he says, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God uh, uh, supplies. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Christ Jesus, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Love me. Love each other. Do good deeds, but do it out of love. Do it out of the sense of gratitude and the grace that God has given you that you and I did not deserve. And that's how we should live. And 1 John 2, 3. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. John 13, 34 to 35, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know, including you, that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That's the higher level. It's not a denomination. It's not just doing church stuff. It's not playing around with religion. It's getting rid of that junk and that fear that leads you into repentance. And then you're like, wow, man, I'm grateful. And I know you love me, God. Nobody would forgive me for what I've done but you. And I love you. And now I'm doing it. I'm living out of love. That's your saving faith. That's how you know and you feel. Lord Jesus, we ask you to give us that fear of anything that has held us into the bondage of sin, any sins of the body, any lawlessness. Against, we're violating your laws, your commandments. We're not obeying you. We ask you to remove that, God. I pray every one of us has that, that striking, if we need it, if it's necessary. If it's not necessary, God, we're grateful. But if we do need it for issues in our lives, the disobedient parts of our lives, that we have a, a dread, a fear of Judgment Day, 
that will correct us and enable us to remove that veil, that blockage that's keeping us from loving you and feeling your love. Lord, that's the kind of faith we want. We want you to help us to get there if we can't get there on our own, as we can't. Lord, help us maintain that love, the gratitude and appreciation with you. And Lord, th those good things you've given us, we pray that we distribute it to others. Uh, love works of service and kindness. We care about other people. We pray for them. We do good deeds. We give money to the poor. We help the orphans, the widows. We have mercy to those uh, around us. We forgive other people as you have forgiven us. We don't want any of this junk hanging over us, Lord. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, give us humble hearts that we're humble enough to admit that we have sinned, that we need your grace. We want your love to be born in our hearts and that spirit of adoption poured out into our hearts. The love of God poured out into our hearts that enables us, that cries out in us, Abba, Father. Abba, Father, that's the faith I want. I want the faith that identifies me as a son of God, as a daughter of God. Holy and reverential fear. Rewarded by the love of God. Lord, I pray a blessing over our brothers and sisters right now. Holy Spirit, we ask you to look into our hearts. Identify areas of shame, of guilt that are a result of sin, unconfessed, unrepented sin. And for those that are having trouble, can't get free so far in this struggle, I pray, God, you enable that freedom. You enable that sheer dread of Judgment Day or whatever it is, whether it's addition, you're pouring your love and grace into their hearts to set them free or the sheer terror of Judgment Day. But I pray it's real and tangible and lasting. In Jesus' name, we pray. Please pray as the Holy Spirit moves you to.